Well, how many of you know that song? Have you heard that song before? Because um, as we were practicing this morning, Linda said she knew it as a kid, but she didn't think she'd ever played it before. Um, but anyway, part of the words of uh, two of the lines in that, I guess it's a hymn, would say, Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth, glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. So I'm counting it as a Christmas song. Um, plus, that's what we do every Christmas season. We tell the story of Jesus and how that all began. And uh, we're going to focus on Matthew chapter 1 this Christmas season, really just verse, well, and we'll get to chapter 2 on Christmas Day. Um, we're going to, just a few verses, like I said, in Matthew chapter 1, but this story actually starts, and you're familiar with this story, with a scandal. Um, and this story is not the first scandal in the history of the world. Uh, it wasn't the last. It seems that every day there's some kind of new scandal, right? A politician or an entertainer or... Someone that we know of has become embroiled in some controversy or scandal involving uh, money or sex or corruption, whatever it may be. Um, but there's nothing like a good scandal to get your name and your face back in the news. Uh, and I think sometimes that's very intentional. In fact, some people, I would even say many, have become famous because of the scandals that they are known for. Um, and sometimes it's an intentional strategy to become famous. Um, there's that old saying, everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame. Well, you can have it if it involves a scandal. So uh, anyway, but P.T. Barnum is noted for saying it this way. Uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity, meaning that even if you're getting publicity, it's all going to be good in the end. Uh, Oscar Wilde said it this way. I kind of like this version better. He says, there's only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. Um, so as we talk about this story this morning, this scandal from Matthew chapter 1, uh, we want to first off acknowledge that this is a story worth talking about, amen? Uh, scandal and controversy get a lot of attention in our day and age with all the media, 24-hour uh, media attention with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, whatever it may be. Uh, it's easy to become famous through a scandal just through an, a news feed. Uh, and if this story that we're going to read had taken place today, it probably wouldn't have got much of a second glance because in terms of the controversy surrounding it, it's not considered that scandalous anymore. Um, yet this is the story of the birth of a king, the birth of the redeemer of mankind, the hope of the world. The first Christmas, think about it, started with a scandal. Not the way we would expect to start a story about the Holy One. So let's look at verse 18. Depending on what version you read, uh, I think this is the NIV, says this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. I love the way Matthew writes that there. Uh, some versions, like when I read this, I always hear the King James Version saying on this wise. It happened on, anybody else King James, that's the way it happened, on this wise. Uh, some, of, some other versions say this is how it came about or it took place in this way. He's like, here's the story I've been trying to tell you. And he's now 18 verses into his, his book that he's writing. Uh, and we'll refer back to some things that happened earlier, uh, a little later. But it says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. So there's a mouthful there. Here, here begins the scandal. Before they came together, meaning in Joseph and Mary's day and age, and I think you're probably familiar with this, there was an engagement period where uh, the parents meet and Joseph and Mary are officially engaged and considered married, but they are not living together. They have not had a physical relationship. Uh, and it's in this period of time when Mary is found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now those, those two phrases are the, what we want to dig in this morning, but this is like uh, as you, if you read this and try to put this in modern times, this is like a story from uh, the Maury Povich show. Do you guys watch? Hopefully you don't, but you're familiar with Maury Povich. He's the guy uh, who has a talk show. Uh, it seems like every show is about doing paternity tests with women who are not sure who the father of their children are. And when Maury gets to the end of his the end of the show, he always pulls the lab test out. He's got a piece of paper and he just has this smug look on his face because now he's going to reveal to us if this man is or is not the father. And it goes both ways at different times. Uh, and the result, the, the, uh, the proposed father 
has different reactions at times depending it can be so there's basically four possible endings he could be happy or sad he could be the father or not be the father so Maury is always going to have one of those four endings but if we were to put this story about Mary and Joseph it's possible that they would end up on the Maury Povich show and Mary would say to Joseph or excuse me Maury Povich would say to Joseph you are not the father and that's where the scandal comes in and Joseph finds himself there because he's engaged to this woman Mary and now there's this scandal that she's pregnant and he knows that he's not the father. But I just wanted to stop briefly this morning and, and remind you that this is not the first scandal the Bible has given us either. We're familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba, of Moses killing an Egyptian. There's many stories in scripture of scandalous, sinful events that go on. Even Matthew's story, the writer of the book that we're reading, is somewhat scandalous from a public perspective. He tells us that he's a tax collector, and in that time they were despised by the Jews uh, because they are working for the Romans and collecting taxes from Jews. And Matthew's not afraid to put that in his own book. I think if I was Matthew, I probably would have left that part out. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more well. But at this point, back to, back to Joseph. Consider his emotions in this moment. Certainly he loved her. He's willing to marry her. He's willing to wait this entire engagement period and build a house for them to live together. He must be excited to be getting married. He's got, also got to be a little bit of anxious about the changes that are going to happen and the pressure that will come from being her husband and can he provide for her or any children that may come. And now all of a sudden he's skipped two steps down the road and there's a child coming. And it wasn't his. So I began to think about this as we consider the emotions of Joseph and we know how the story goes and we're gonna to get to these the rest of this in the coming weeks but I had a question as I got here did Mary tell Joseph she was pregnant before the angel did because in the story if we follow Matthew's timeline that's the way this happens and we know from Luke chapter 1 that Mary received this visit from an angel explaining what has happened and the angel in Luke chapter 1 goes into some detail with Mary about the what and the why and the how. Joseph, when he talks to the angel, gets much less. And we'll talk about that, I believe, next week. But if we follow the strict way that Matthew tells this story, then the angel hasn't told Joseph about Mary yet, and he's hearing it from her. He's been asked by his bride to believe that a miracle has occurred with her pregnancy. What's his reaction in that moment? We don't know. I would guess because Matthew doesn't know. He probably wasn't there. Joseph, some would suggest that Joseph did not live that much longer into Jesus' adulthood, so Matthew may never have met him. But based on the phrase that we also find in verse 18, she was found, some have suggested that Mary didn't tell anyone and no one said or did anything until it became obvious that she was pregnant. Did, most, did Joseph hear from the town gossip that Mary was pregnant because she couldn't hide it anymore? And the angel hasn't come to him yet. Think about the, 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 the wheels spinning in his mind as this is going on. As he's trying to think about well, who could the father possibly be because the angel hasn't spoken to him yet. And then Mary comes and tells him this fantastic story about an angel appearing to her. And he's got to believe this. I got to tell you, that'd be a stretch for me. That's a tough one for me. I'm engaged to this young woman. I want to marry her. I'm in love with her. And now she's pregnant. And she's got a story that this baby is from God. Which has never happened in the course of human history. So there's probably quite a bit of stress and wondering in Joseph's mind before he gets that visit from the angel. How many days pass? How many sleepless nights does he go through wondering, what am I going to do about this? Joseph could have thought, when were you going to tell me this? You're only telling me this unbelievable story now because you can't hide it anymore? Like I said, Matthew doesn't go into that for us. So Joseph basically has a couple of options that were pretty common for the day. The first one, there's two ways to handle the issue. The first one is to expose Mary and say she's obviously committed adultery and expose her to the punishment of stoning, which was... The, the scriptural punishment, they didn't follow it through on it a lot, but that's one example. The other was to divorce her quietly, which is the actual phrase that, is, that the word that the verse uses. And there would be two witnesses there, and, they, and he could kind of remove himself from the situation, just kind of wash his hands and say, well, you're on your own. 
And Scripture tells us that that was what he was going to do. He didn't want to make an embarrassment of, of Mary and, and call her out and, and subject her to a stoning or any kind of public judgment or trial or any sort of thing. But he's going to be somewhat noble and at least keep it quiet. But he's like, I have a mind to be out of this story. I think he really had a tough time with this when Mary comes to him. One of our messages in this series is called The Choice. And, we're gonna, and, mo, and this is the first of Joseph's choices that he has here is what is he going to do about this situation. So let's see what he chooses here in verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So we cannot say that Joseph didn't know about the situation and just disappeared from the scene. He's got a decision and a choice that he has to make. The Message Bible describes Joseph at this point as, I love the way that the phrase is it, chagrined but noble. <laughs> he's a good man. He, wants to do, he says he's a righteous man. He wants to do the right thing, but he is still a little bit troubled by this. He didn't want this to become a public scandal and expose Mary to the side-eyed looks from the community and the gossip that would certainly come through, the speculation about who the father was. But he has a plan to just divorce her quietly. And without having his angel's message yet, he has to take Mary's word on the subject. And it seems that he's concerned about her public standing, but he's not quite interested in being part of the story. He'll go back to his life as a carpenter. He and Mary will be legally divorced and go their own separate ways. And that's a pretty tough choice, even in that day. And I want to say again that he's at least being somewhat noble, but it's hard to know what he was really thinking. So we've read these two verses this morning, and I look at the life of Joseph and Mary and this scandal that is caused, and I think we would all like our life stories to be nice and perfect and scandal-free, wouldn't we? Matthew doesn't let us live under the illusion that this supernatural conception is somehow a story that we sinful human beings cannot relate to. Matthew says there's a scandal here. There's earthly humanity involved in the way this story begins. There's speculation. In telling this story, Matthew has already given us this genealogy of Joseph. And we'll talk about why, why would that matter if Joseph's not the father. We'll talk about that in a few weeks, maybe next week. Linda read for us a passage last week about the genealogy of Jesus and pointed out a few names. Matthew is tracing Joseph's ancestry and very peculiar, he leaves in several scandalous women. Tamar and Rahab and Bathsheba in verses 3, 5, and 6. And he's, what he says about Bathsheba, I don't think he uses her name. He says she, she had been someone else's wife. Reminding us of the scandal that had happened in the life of, and the genealogy of Joseph. Matthew didn't skip that part out. If I'm writing the genealogy, I kind of leave her name off. Because we know that they like to trace it through the men anyway. Why include these scandalous women? Prostitutes. And adulterers, women with shady backgrounds. I was doing some reading this week. I want to read you a paragraph. Tim Keller has some interesting thoughts on this subject. He said this, Matthew's genealogy of Jesus does a lot of work. First, it roots Jesus in history. The gospel doesn't begin once upon a time. Christ isn't a legend. He was a flesh and blood human being in space and time. Second, the genealogy includes women who were racial and cultural outsiders. Rahab and Ruth, as well as they were involved in incest, adultery, and prostitution. Tamar, Uriah's wife, and Rahab. In ancient and less individualistic times, one's genealogy was like one's resume. Like today's resumes, many things were usually expunged to make it look better to the reader. Women were seldom put in ancient genealogies at all, let alone women who reminded readers of the sordid sins and corruption of ancestors such as Judah and David. All of these figures would have been disowned or expunged from a normal genealogy, but here they are not. They are all, male and female, king and prostitute, Jew and Gentile, equally part of Jesus' family. So even the begats of the Bible drip with God's mercy. You see, Matthew's not afraid to record their names. It would have been easy to omit them. And I said, that's what I probably would have done. 
But is it possible, let's think about this from Matthew's perspective. He's already, he's going to tell us of his own tax collector, his own public shame. Is it possible that he has personally experienced this public scrutiny and shame of being a tax collector? Then he also experienced the person and the mercy and the grace of Jesus that Matthew doesn't consider this genealogy, this background, a problem. To be honest, that's good news for all of us. Matthew was a witness to Jesus being in the presence of the outcasts of society, the healing of lepers. He may have been standing there when, uh, they, in John chapter 8, they bring the woman caught in adultery, and Jesus' response is to let him who was among you without sin cast the first stone. He's in that moment, he's a witness to Jesus' mercy and forgiveness for a scandalous situation. Perhaps that's why Matthew doesn't feel it's, it's, not, it's not wrong to include these names in the genealogy. You see, God is not afraid of a scandal, nor is he afraid of our sin. It seems to me that Matthew would identify what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and this is on the screen. Paul writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that, in, so that Christ's power may rest on me. What's Paul saying? I'm not afraid or ashamed of who I am, because it just makes Christ look better. He says in verse 10, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's what Matthew's doing. He says, I'm not ashamed of this genealogy of Christ. I've seen this living Christ. This is not an embarrassment on his reputation. The story of Jesus begins with hope in the midst of scandal. And Matthew's not afraid to include this genealogy. He's not afraid to tell of his own scandal. But sometimes we are afraid of our own scandals, right? And our own sin. We want to hide them, not just from everyone else, but pretend that we can hide them from God. Well, maybe your life has been a stranger to scandal, but you're not a stranger to sin. We've all likely done things that we regret. Let me tell you this again this morning, that God is not afraid of your scandal. God is not afraid of your sin. He wants to use it to tell a wonderful story like Matthew's going to do here. Think about it this way. Don't all of the heroes in our stories rise from lowly circumstances? Every great redemption story starts with an orphan or a reject, right? If you've never done this exercise, you should do this because I know we've had this discussion at our house. Take some time and look at how many of our stories of heroes in literature and movies have as the main character an orphan, an outsider, or a reject. Batman, right? His parents were killed when he was a kid. Superman is an exile from his own planet. Harry Potter's parents were killed when he was a kid. Just go through and you can just... In nearly every story that we love, the main character has a background that has left them as an outsider. God knows your secrets. He knows your scandal. He knows your, your shame. And he's here to redeem and forgive your sin. And that's the greatest part of the story. There's a key element in this story that we'll see here in verse 21 when we get there. It says, because he will save his people from their sins. He's not worried about your sin because he's going to save you from that. But the good news is that it doesn't change him from writing your story. The key phrase in this redemption story is that Mary was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, this is just a regular scandal. Mary's an adulterer. Joseph is a divorcee. And they probably go their own separate ways. But because the Holy Spirit is involved in this story, it changes everything. See, the key to turning this story from just an everyday scandal and sin into a beautiful purpose is that God's spirit was involved. And this is the word that became flesh, the one that in John writes, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And God's people said. So the, skin and the, sandal, the sin and the scandal in your life cannot be overcome by the light of the world. The same thing applies to your life. The key to the turn in your life from scandal and sin into beautiful purpose is the work of God. Some of you are familiar with the author Lisa Turkhurst. 
I saw something that she had written this week, a quote. says, what you see isn't the whole story, the story of the scandal of your life. It says, with God, there is always a meanwhile. While the scandal and the sin are obvious and sometimes public, God is doing something meanwhile around the edges of the story with a greater purpose. And when the world sees shame and scandal, God sees an opportunity to tell a different story. You see, God is in the business of happy endings, of renewing and restoring and redeeming those outcasts and those rejects, those separated from society by scandal and by sin. That's who God uses because he loves to, to thrive in our weaknesses. See, people often look at Scripture and they disparage it by citing examples of bad things that people have done in Scripture. And they say, well, look at all those people in Scripture. They weren't perfect. And I'm like, yeah, they weren't. That's the good news because we're not either. That's what's exciting about this is the Bible isn't a bunch of perfect people. It's, it describes David as a man after God's own heart and we know that he's an adulterer and a murderer. And if God can redeem and restore David, he can do it for us. That is the good news of this story. So I think it's very fitting that in Matthew chapter 1, the scandalous Matthew writes a scandalous genealogy about a scandalous Mary and Joseph. It says, look at all these things that are going on and God's going to tell a great story. See, because if God is writing your story, as he was writing Matthew's story, he's not scared of your scandal or your sin. In fact, his story is meant to redeem and repurpose it. As we tell the story of Jesus that has begun with this scandal in the coming weeks, we'll see a messenger that suggests a significant name for this child. And then he leaves Joseph with a choice. Joseph, again, has to make a difficult decision. He actually makes several in the next couple chapters. Martin Lloyd-Jones has, Lloyd has said, The Christian is a man who can be certain about the ultimate, even when he is most uncertain about the immediate. I think that may have been what carried Joseph through. Is he knew he trusted God, and he trusted Mary, although he's going to divorce her quietly, but we know how the story goes, right, ultimately. I wanted to conclude today with a tweet I saw this weekend. It's an important reminder for us all. As we enter the season of the greatest story ever told that has a scandalous beginning, be certain this morning that God wants to write your story. The way Matthew tells us this story moves from scandal to certainty. Here was the tweet. You're not too lost for God to find. You're not too dirty for God to cleanse. You're not too broken for God to fix. You're not too hurt for God to heal. You're not too far for God to reach. You're not too guilty for God to forgive. And you're not too sinful for God to save. And God's people said, when all we see is the scandal and the sin, he sees the miracle and the redemption story he can work in us.